right. I'm going to be doing an update on uh, my build, uh, Nature is Murder. And uh, also, I put together some slides to have a discussion on uh, what I've been thinking of lately as a read-write rubric. So I'll explain what that is when we get to that. Okay. So the agenda, quick build update, uh, hopefully a demo that uh, works a little bit. Uh, then what I'm planning to do for the rest of the year, which is uh, do a little bit more on mechanical design, speculative stuff, and then uh, discussion on redroid programics. All right. So recap for uh, the story so far, in case you uh, joined late or otherwise don't remember what I've been up to. So since we are more than a year into this project, if you remember when we kicked it off, one of the first things I showed was a design study of a rocker bogey um, um, rover. So it was printed in black PLA, there's pictures in the old uh, slides. <laughs> it was passive, it had no motors or anything. Then I did an initial design and I was uh, basing the initial design on the uh, two inch long yellow TT motors that a lot of people use. And later I changed that to the N20 motor, which is much smaller and compact and has like inbuilt gear ratio that's much better. And uh, uh, during the Yakathon, we had this reinventing the wheel session. This time last year, what I was doing was I was prototyping the differential mechanism for the rover and um, still doing the motor shopping. Then I think August was my big update when I showed the full 3D design of the uh, Nature is Murder build. And I did the initial fabrication of the uh, ABTF, which is accessory before the fact. And that uh, that's probably my biggest um, session of work so far. Uh, in October, I got the initial harness for ABTF done and did some initial tests on BeagleBone Blue. And on demo day, I showed the full test assembly of um, Nature is Murder. And what I think, yeah what I think of as a first fire for um, ABTF, um, as in just turning it on and seeing what happens. Uh, last, uh, last session that I did, uh, there was no progress on the build. Um, this time, hopefully I'll have a little more to show. Uh, and uh, in parallel of the sort of broader topics I've been interested in, the wheels um, after the Twitter thing, uh, I did a session on CAD design and then uh, we had the discussion on what an AI OS would be like. And I think in the demo day, I mainly talked about like how to manage the bill of materials and stuff. And last time I talked about three laws of uh, RoboRx. And this time read write RoboRx. Okay. So just to remind us, status in December was on the left, we have accessory before the fact, which is a very simple uh, one piece chassis with uh, four wheels, two of them driven, all four of them steered. And Nature is Murder is this uh, six wheel uh, rocker bogey with a differential bar. That one, I just finished the assembly and um, the accessory before the fact, I had like, this is kind of a lie, the rigging was not really complete. Uh, it's complete kind of now. Uh, all right. And the goals I put down on demo day was to continue the uh, building of, uh, I guess, ABTF and NIM up the stack. So mechanical is done, electrical was almost done, and I was going to get up to compute and stuff. Uh, and uh, the goal there is like extremely basic stuff. And the new stuff I wanted to do for this year, which is still kind of the same, is do the mechanical design for a second generation rover and try and build something that maybe a lot of people can build easily and cheaply. And again, the areas of focus are mainly still mechanical, but this year I do want to learn a little bit more about uh, electrical power management and so forth. Okay. Uh, these are the next steps I put down in my October update uh, when I showed off the ABTF uh, first fire stuff, um, like turning on the beagle bone and stuff. Um, I made up this roadmap of flail, crawl, walk, run, dance. So I think I mentioned last time that the crawl, walk, run is from a client of mine. I thought it was a very clever way to talk about a new engineering project, but I was like in such a primitive, messy state that I had to add a stage called flail before crawl 
And that's where I was last time. I was flailing. Uh, I've moved up to crawl. So that's improvement. Uh, and dance is, yeah, once you get good enough at the basic rover that you can actually focus on like high level applications, that's eventually where I want to get to. So that's the main development part. And on the right is all the other stuff that honestly I'm not that interested in, but you kind of have to do to get this uh, stuff done. And uh, this is where I'm still kind of stuck and running into problems. But basically a lot of environment management, uh, running stuff in embedded Linux, uh, learning how the BeagleBone um, uh, hardware works. Okay, so the progress. Uh, NIM, which is nature is murder. Um, Initially, I designed it with uh, ball joints at the head. So let me, yeah, this one, uh, can you see my cursor? So the main hinge that connects the rocker bogey to the uh, body, that was a ball joint. And initially I thought that would make it nice and flexible and like give it a lot of freedom. But it turns out the ball joints I used were not strong enough to actually hold the rover properly. And it was kind of like flopping badly. Like it was just like caving in. So I decided to simplify the design and um, uh, disassembled this and I'm getting rid of the ball joint and I'm just gonna put an axle straight through, but I have to redesign some fixtures in order to do that. So that's on hold, but that I kind of know what to do. It's um, fairly straightforward and in my wheelhouse. Um, and ABTF is where the focus is because that's where I can get to compute and um, uh, programming here. So things I've done, I finished the wire harness um, so last time when I showed it, the way it was set up was um, nothing was actually soldered. This time it's properly soldered with uh, actual connections instead of these uh, alligator clips. So basically it was uh, 12 uh, solder joints. And since I suck at this, uh, it took me a while to like get around to it and do it right. Uh, I got it wrong a couple of times. Uh, but incidentally, this means that because of the way the test code uh, is set up, it's not set up to do multi-threaded stuff where I can set up the encoders and get them running, put that in the background and then go do stuff with the motors. The sample code I have available only runs one at a time. And if you try to start one uh, test code, it kills the other. So, and I haven't yet been able to figure out how to build my own um, even simple code that does two things at once. So right now the wire, wire harness is done and I did testing of encoders and motors separately, but now it's basically just the motors running. Um, I had some servo chatter issues where when I was trying to control the servo motors for steering, it would jitter and chatter horribly. And then I realized what was happening was it was because I was running it off mains power and that issue vanished when I put it on battery. And I guess that's because the servos run on 50 Hertz and that's close enough to supply. And if it's not smoothed out properly, the supply interferes somehow. Uh, the other thing that happened was the servos, whenever I tried to control one of them, all four of them would like jitter around a little bit. And I suspect that's because uh, the way I have the wire harness set up, all the cabling kind of like just bunched up on top with a cable tie. If you're running 50 Hertz, uh, uh, sort of uh, control signals through these wires. I'm assuming there's some sort of, I don't know, inductive coupling or something. So when you're actually just trying to control one servo, the other three kind of shake around a little bit. So as a temporary patch, what I've done is I've just disconnected two of the servos. And I think what I need to do to resolve that issue is just get rid of the excess cable or separate it um, somehow physically, because I think there's some sort of coupling going on. So right now there's just two. Are you running uh, it from a battery or uh, <coughs> plugging yeah, it? Right now I'm running it from a battery. The battery uh, switching from mains to battery switched, uh, got rid of some of the jitter, but it still didn't get rid of the coupling type behavior. And now that I've kind of um, disconnected two of the servos, the behavior is slightly improved. But uh, let's see, what else did I have to say? Okay, um, yeah. When I calibrate the wheel alignments to zero, so for facing forward is zero degrees, it doesn't stay stable between boot ups. Like it drifts a little bit. So I'm not yet sure what to do about that. This is like cheap SG90 servos, which are like, you know, a buck each. I'm sure if I had more expensive steering motors, I would have like, you know, some way to actually do feedback measurement on the actual steering angle. So that's something to think about. But for now, it's not a, such a big deal. I got um, the uh, Venkatesh, yeah. th that's exactly what, what I was talking about last time when we talked about accuracy. Okay. 
and um, maybe you don't have zero, you uh, weave forward, call it dancing. It, it, it's okay. not that simple. I do think I have to get to like fairly precise alignment because otherwise the wheel drags and sometimes it stalls completely and stuff like that. So that's exactly a different engineering approach. I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong, I do it too. Yeah. I'm just saying that's a particular engineering approach that we're taking, which is bottom up. We're saying we're going to make the motor do what we tell it to do, and then we'll think about what we want to tell it. Fair enough. Uh, I think uh, that's a broader philosophical discussion to have. I, I think there's sort of a, I don't know, kind of a Heisenberg uncertainty thing where you have kind of an uncertainty budget, and if you use too much imprecision budget in one area of the design, you kind of have to pay for it elsewhere. So it's it's not there's no free lunch uh, situation kind of going on here. Uh, reload this. The web server should be up, hopefully. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm having problems with uh, the make file for the sample code not finding the right libraries and linking to it correctly. So my very simple crawl command program that tries to do two things at once, which is run the motors and encoders together, it's not compiling. So I'll figure that out. There's also like Python code, like I showed last time, that's not as well developed. So I think I'm gonna have to stay in C for the time being. Uh, but okay, this has loaded. And uh, let's uh, try and do some. Can you, can you remind us how this is connected to your browser, to, to your robot? Um, this is, um, the rover is on Wi-Fi basically, and it boots up this Cloud9 editor, which uh, is hosted on AWS. So uh, I'm not entirely sure how all that works. Since it's kind of out, out of my wheelhouse a little bit, I just followed instructions. So. All right. Can you guys see my screen and the um, rover? Yes. If you do side by side display uh, on the um, screen, you should be able to see both at around the equal size. So let's see. Why, why is the Volvo blinking at us? That's just, I don't know, that's the LED code. <laughs> All right, right now, what I mean, these things are like, um, um, all the tests coded tests one subsystem at a time, and uh, you can only run one at a time. If you try to put it in the background and start another one, it kills the first process. So you can only do one thing at a time. Um, so right now I just ran the motor a little. So let's see what else. I'm gonna zero out the servers. Only two of the servers are connected. Yeah, I have to kill this. If you watch my shell, you can see that I'm literally just killing each process each time. Let's do a turn. Okay, I've turned the wheels a little bit. Let's go back to driving. Yay, I'm demonstrating a turn now. And let's complete the mission by going back. Right, let's, actually, let's turn the servos the other way. And And I don't know if you can see very clearly, but uh, the some of the wheels are dragging because the serving is uh, the steering is just really not right. Uh, all right, 
Let me do one more thing. It seems to move very smoothly. Uh, yeah, it's, it's reasonably smooth and I think it helps that it's on a carpet because the wheels are actually not uh, properly level. And uh, I'm actually running it not at, um, let me run it backwards a little now. I'm running it at about three quarters uh, speed. And let's uh, zero it out again. And let's run it full speed forward. This is about as fast as it goes. I think it can go a little far faster, but I'm not going to stress the motor more. All right, and let's check the battery. That's the right one. Okay. It seems to be, it doesn't actually draw much. It's like one amp uh, total draw at the moment, I think. I still haven't figured out how to like um, estimate life and stuff. At some point I'll do an endurance test. But okay, that's basically my demo. These are bash scripts, right? Uh, no, these are uh, C programs uh, that have already been compiled into a um, library that's running. So there's a service running on the computer uh, that's the lib robot control library. It's C code, but I think it, been, it can be called from uh, Python and Ruby and JavaScript as well. There's like some samples uh, randomly around. Uh, and yeah, I'm just calling them from the command line, but yeah, it's C, uh, small C programs. The source is available. And uh, basically the program I'm trying to write now is basically take the sample of motor and encoder codes and put them in the same file and compile it so that I can run both together. But uh, I'm running into compilation error problems. Give me a second while I unplug the battery here. Okay, that's the demo part. Okay, so yeah, apart from just uh, finishing the soldering, the other physical thing I had to do was the shoes for the motors kept falling off in the first tests because it was just press fit and the tolerance wasn't very good. So the first couple of times I ran this, it ran into my chair and the shoe would fall off and then the motor fell off. So all these small details really matter. So I had to add a couple of um, screws to hold it in place. And um, okay. So next steps, uh, software. So I, I've divided the stuff into the grind that's like depressing shit that I have to do to just keep moving forward. And on the level up column is the stuff that I think is actually fun to do that I'm looking forward to. So my personal psychology management is to try and do a balance of both so I stay motivated. So on the grind front, figure out all these into, uh, environment issues, uh, uh, pick either Python or C. I think I'm going to have to go with C simply because there's a lot more sample code available, but we'll see. Uh, I want to get the camera going. I think the only way to connect the camera on this board is directly to the um, USB. It has I2C and a couple of other, uh, uh, not I2C. Uh, there's a couple of other uh, options, but the cameras available for those are really primitive. So I'm going to try and go with the USB camera. Uh, enable control over internet. Um, I don't know how to do that yet. This uh, shell command that I was showing you, that runs on a local port 3000. So I'm not entirely sure how the whole setup works and how to get it to the point where you guys can control it from uh, around the world. Uh, and whatever we decide on the Yakru or shared API, uh, support it. So here I'm gonna be basically taking cues from you guys. I'll be following rather than leading since uh, this is my weakest spot. Uh, on hardware, I have to figure out something about the wheel alignment issues. I need to add a simple upper deck so I can do things like add a camera or something. Uh, the NIM redesign, replace the ball joints, uh, put in wider wheels, and then I have to finish the rigging on the NIM. Uh, now I know how to do it, I can do it. Uh, and I think I'm gonna modify the NIM chassis so that it can um, support the Raspberry Pi as well, which is gonna be a fairly significant modification because the Beagle bone can deliver a fair amount of power directly to motors. 
So you don't need motor breakout boards. The edge bridges can deliver about one amp each. And the total board power budget is about uh, five to six amps uh, at peak. So you basically don't need uh, separate hardware. The way they made the BeagleBone blue is they took the BeagleBone uh, regular and uh, which had a robotic scape, and then they put the uh, robotic scape uh, integrated it into the main board. So it makes everything very easy. With the RPI, I don't think such an option is available, which means I would need a hat or I would need motor breakout boats. Uh, uh, those, I guess, are like an inch by an inch or so. So I could put one on top of each motor mount. So the way I'm thinking is, oh yeah, the white one, each of the front and rear wheels um, has a drive motor and there's enough room there to probably mount a small motor control breakout board on top if I wanted, or make the central chassis much bigger so it's tall enough to accommodate a full RPI hat and then you run it from there. So one of these two things is what I'm gonna try and do. Okay. Uh, and, why are you moving to RPI 4? I guess because the rest of you are doing Raspberry Pi and it'll be somewhat easier if you have a similar platform. Also just, I don't know, feels like it would be good to have the design support uh, multiple popular boards. Okay. If other people want to like uh, print this design and use it. Yeah, but Raspberry Pi doesn't have an onboard or like uh, chip uh, real-time core inside. So this uh, BeagleBone has a, I think, a PRU inside the same SOC. So yeah. they same share the same interconnect. Uh, but with Raspberry Pi, you will have to add another external microcontroller for real-time stuff. And then... Uh, uh, yeah, 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 you're right. So you, not only will we need motor controllers, we'll need an extra PRU thing as well. So yeah, um, that's uh, some consideration. So it's it's sort of a stretch goal. I'm, I'm missing here. What kind of real-time do you need? Well, if you're doing BLDC control, you can't do it with uh, our, our Raspberry Pi. That's what I'm trying to understand. Why not? Uh, because uh, the timing, because Linux won't be able to manage the timings. The, the Vova is moving very slowly. Yeah, so it depends if you want real-time control or not. Yeah, I think uh, it will be necessary if I'm doing something that requires very fast responses like a drone or a you know inverted pendulum being balanced or something. But the rover is probably slow enough. So, but it's this is why I want to do the experiment. I want to see how generalizable the physical design is to a couple of different board choices, and if it if it requires a lot more sort of uh, uh, breakout boards and stuff, the physical design has to be modified significantly. So I just want to like see what, what's involved. Okay, on the level up side, I want to try a few new mechanical designs, basically sort of um, uh, explore a little bit more. I want to build a new test rig, which I, I'll show you guys sketches of all this, a new test rig, a test uh, bed for variable structure, and the simplest possible sort of uh, design study of a uh, leg for uh, leg drawers and maybe a paper napkin level study of what a humanoid rover would be like. And a total stretch goal is um, the problem of wire harnesses and cable management is starting to interest me because it's like this big mess that everybody avoids thinking about. And I'm wondering if there's like good systematic solutions like you know a rigid interconnect design that is modular and extensible and is not a mess. So uh, that's something I wanna spend some time thinking about. And in general, my, uh, the kind of role I'm trying to self-select into for this year is since uh, the focus is on the AI OS and I know very little to nothing about that. And several of you know a way more about operating systems. I kind of want to like uh, flesh out the mechanical design space. So you guys have more to think about in terms of what sorts of physical builds the operating system will need to support. So I kind of want to like explore that corner of the year collaboration a little. Okay. So uh, I can only- can you, can you explain number two, the variable structure capability design? I, I should, I'll explain it in two slides with a sketch. Okay. All right. So the test trick number two I wanna build is, I wanna simplify these over I just showed, which I think is too complex. I thought it was simpler than my, the full rocker bogey six wheel is really complex. The four wheeler is simpler, but it still has like four servo motors that interfere, blah, blah, blah. So I want to simplify. I want to do a tricycle, which has like more better stability. One wheel won't be off the ground. Since three is a tripod, it'll always be stable. 
and I'm only going to steer one of the wheels and I'm going to keep two pure drive and one pure steering. And um, it'll still be BeagleBone Blue or maybe generic to RPI, but I want to add a couple of struts to maybe add solar panels. So this will be a test trick that can handle like solar panel experiments. And maybe the green part that I'm showing on the top left, that's a fragment of a uh, second deck to do payload stuff. So uh, I'll try and, so this is not a difficult design. It'll take me an afternoon to design this and maybe a couple of days to print and rig this. The idea is to like simplify what I have but also make it capable of doing more experiments. And this one, I'm naming it Fermi Estimate because this year I'm very interested in Fermi Estimation and things like that. So I'm picking names related to that. So this test trick will be called Fermi Estimate. And the wire harness and um, motor sort of peripherals I have on the current rig, I should be able to just rip them out and put, the, put them directly on this because the cabling is done. And it's just a question of like mechanically pulling it out and putting it in here. So it's almost like pulling out a nervous system and putting it in a new body, which is a kind of like design strategy I'm interested in exploring. Okay, this is what I mean by variable geometry. So the idea is what is the absolute simplest physical configuration that allows you to vary as many interesting structural variables as possible. So here, the way I would do it is just four structural members uh, forming a rectangle with uh, the control board chassis suspended in the middle. And then I wanna have these uh, kind of like sliding wheel or leg units that can slide along. You can reposition them anywhere. You can make the rectangle smaller or bigger. You can make it like four wheels or four legs or six wheels, six legs. You can uh, add more or less steering. So I figured this is like, as simple as you can get to a certain amount of interesting variable geometry. So I'm gonna try and design and fabricate a version of this. So this is the sort of, uh, the schematic of the idea. If I actually do it, it'll probably end up looking something like this. Um, so uh, I learned to work with like uh, square cross section aluminum last year. So I'm comfortable with that as a sort of design approach now. Use bits of aluminum tubing, and the custom printed 3D uh, joints. That way you can get much larger structures than trying to 3D print the whole thing. So uh, I'll show you an example that I've been using that strategy. But if I do this and then I have the sliding wheel or leg unit, I'm initially gonna start with just wheel units. You can kind of do a bunch of different uh, configurations and have a lot of uh, experimental capability. So this is what I mean by variable structure. And I'm calling this Dyson's hammer because I'm trying to like uh, practice uh, Freeman Dyson's approach to design, which is like a simple thing that like pushes a few important variables in a important direction. I wrote a blog post about that recently. So for me and Dyson are my two mechanical design rig things that I want to experiment with. And this, uh, now that I have like some spectator understanding of how leg robotics works from uh, uh, Mayor and Eric's work uh, so far, I kind of want to take a stab at designing my own leg. And this would be the kind of leg that could go on the variable structure uh, chassis that I showed in the last slide. But basically it would be a sliding tube, two limbs, a ball joint, a cylindrical joint at the knee, and then the bottom would be some sort of two degree of freedom joint. And candidate technologies for actually actuating this. Hydraulics are complete mess and I don't think you can get them at very small form factors. Plus it's not clear that um, there are suitable hydraulic fluids for uh, really low temperatures. Uh, rotary motors with the right kind of like gearing might be an option. Linear motors, I have no experience with them but might be worth experimenting with. Um, Springs are interesting. So a couple of the sketches I was doing, I was using like actuation in one direction. So just tension only cable pulling. So a cable pulls up the you know lower leg from the thigh, uh, but to snack back, you would use a spring. So you only need to actuate in tension. You don't need uh, uh, compression. But the problem with springs is I think springs also have a problem in extreme environment. They get brittle because uh, spring materials don't do well in like, you know, minus 150 degrees or whatever it is. So that's something to think about. Can springs work? This is the reason uh, the Mars rovers don't use springs. Uh, uh, that's you, the reason. Hmm? Can, can you explain what you mean by low temperatures? You use uh, between minus five and uh, 
minus 150. So I haven't dug deep, but I briefly remember reading that the reason the Mars rovers use that mechanical linkage differential mechanism is that the materials used for like normal springs, if you go sufficiently low temperature, it goes through a phase transition and crystallizes and it becomes rigid or something. So no, that's I, one of the reasons. I, I understand, but what temperature is your design point? You say there's no hydraulics at low temperature. So what, what's your design? I don't know. I don't know. That's why I'm listing these as questions to explore. Like, all right, maybe we can use a hydraulic and it's uh, usable inside caves in the moon and on Earth, but it's not usable on Mars, something like that. I don't know. So this is a research question for me. It might be good to like uh, do a small research uh, about the, what are the materials that can we can use on Mars. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, Ingenuity uses a lot of off-the-shelf components. So uh, with respect to mechanics, uh, what are the materials we can use to build something there? Yeah. yeah. And I think you have to look at materials and also how you're using them. So rigid structural components are one thing. Shatter uh, strain is another thing. Like some materials have good tensile strength at one temperature, but will shatter at other temperatures. Uh, spring behavior is a fairly radical um, it's almost like, you know, I think it turns into like a crystal of ice or something almost. It'll shatter. It's like, uh, I'm trying to think. Okay. Rubber is another good example. The reason they can't use rubber tires on Mars, even though there's like air pressure and stuff, is uh, rubber becomes like glass at uh, really low temperatures. So you can't use rubber. It's not soft. Uh, but for this design study, I might try something like a cable-like system. So use a servo motor and then uh, the way the drone guys use like cables to like move ailerons and things like that, some strategy like that to move uh, limbs. And of course, it, it might be worth doing at least a Google level study of are there smart materials that can work like muscles? Um, can okay. you go back to the previous slide? Before, yeah. Um, this one, yeah. Um, how does this connect with uh, a harness issue? In other words, I'm looking at this design, it looks very, very flat, which makes it maybe natural to have a layer of interconnect that yep. provides a harness functionality. Yeah, so a couple of potential options here is you have a layer that has rigid... Uh, uh, conduction. So you can have like a rectangular conducting ring. And then you have a system by which uh, like, you know, electric locomotives on the electric powered uh, railroad system, they have, um, I forget what it's called, pantograph or something that touches the wire. And that's how you draw power. That has problems, it has friction problems, lubrication problems, but it's a strategy. You can like have a rectangular bus that's delivering power. And then you just use mechanical connection to like draw power at any given point. So that kind of thing might work or you have flexible cabling that just has enough um, sort of, um, what do you call it, uh, play in it, uh, that it can cover the range of motion. So if the carriages here can be between four inches to 10 inches apart, you leave enough cable with like some spooling mechanism uh, so that it can move back and forth. Or you provide like hollow tubing and if it were tube like this, you can have yeah. hollow tubing and then have like access ports with clamps, you can have like holes at different points and the carriage can move and reach in and clamp the conductor. So all sorts of interesting possibilities, uh, but I think it's, it's an important and interesting research question because it falls between the gaps of like electrical design, mechanical design, materials design, kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay. And humanoid rovers, I'm just starting to think of it. And I think this form factor is interesting because it's even more agile and uh, capable than the spider. So the spider is more capable than um, the wheel rovers. And this is even more capable than the spider because it can do like, you know, climbing trees and hang from vertical things and stuff like that. So, but this is really complex. Like this is the simplest, like uh, off the top of my head sketch I could do. It's got like seven three degrees of freedom ball joints, uh, four what I'm calling one and a half degrees, like elbows and knees that you can think of as one and a half because one of the degrees is not full. Uh, and this is not even counting uh, uh, the fingers and toes of uh, feet and hands. <laughs> and one interesting insight that hit me was uh, heads are actually another kind of limb. 
quite literally, you could think of the generalized limb in this as it can be a hand, it can be a leg, or it can be a head, depending on how you orient it. So if you look at this configuration, if your limb is pointing downwards, it becomes a leg. If it's pointing sideways, it becomes a hand. If it's pointing upwards and you mount a little camera platform on it, it becomes a head, right? So it, limbs are like surprisingly versatile. So it would be interesting to design like a limb strategy, basically. So this is something I want to do at least at a paper napkin level. Uh, and this is uh, the question you were asking, Mayor. Like, uh, what are the important questions to think about when talking about um, the interconnect? So I'm calling it the boss bus, but I don't mean the bus at the logical level, like CAN bus, or you know, the level at which the computer sees it as a logical entity. I'm thinking of the bus bottom up as how does the physical hardware see the bus? Does it see a bunch of rigid wires? Does it see a bunch of spooled cabling? Does it see something that's uh, power and signal lines on the same uh, conduit or are they separated? How is the uh, electromagnetic isolation handled? What are the th uh, material chemical thermal shielding issues? Uh, how does, like, this was one of the, I think, uh, more interesting things uh, for me mechanically last year. Sorry, where am I? Let me go back to Nim here. So here, if you remember, I showed you guys last time, these joints, uh, the cable, I was routing them through these aluminum members, pulling them out around the joints and then routing them to the next members. This is actually, a serious problem. I was looking on Adafruit and uh, they have like components for, for example, routing power across a rotating member. So you have a rotating uh, joint like Christmas lights, right? You have flashing Christmas lights on a rotating disc. You need something like a copper commutator to deliver power across the fully, you know, uh, greater than 360 degree uh, joint. Here you won't have that problem, but even here, if the joint is moving in weird ways, cabling will come under like constant fatiguing stress. So how do you manage that? You can leave some compliance, but then there's a trade-off because the compliance might catch in the joint and like get um, uh, chewed up, right? So non-trivial problem. And again, one of those sort of boring looking problems until you take a deeper look. Uh, and this is, I think an interesting um, sort of collaborative thing to maybe do a shared session on. So maybe my, one of my next updates, I'll make a deep dive into just exploring this question. All right, so that's my uh, build update. Oh, it's already 45 minutes. Uh, let's see how long we can spend on this. Okay, so let's move on right to the read write robotics, which is the discussion I wanted to have. So the basic thought I had was, we tend to think of roving as a read-only activity as default, right? Like uh, this is a sign that you see in American national parks quite often, take only pictures, leave only footprints. This is a more expanded version. Kill only time, take only pictures, remove only rubbish, leave only footprints. And this is the null hypothesis. Don't damage the environment, just kind of like explore in a read-only mode. You might do a little bit of sample collection, but we tend not to get more ambitious than this for good reasons, right? But the alt hypothesis is, can you do read write rubric in a sort of responsible way? And I kind of want to give you guys some thought starter examples and ideas on this. So what I mean by read write rubrics is we tend to operate only in read only mode. So for example, Curiosity, the older rover, it only took pictures and it only left footprints literally like it's wheel tracks. But Perseverance has pushed the envelope a little bit. It's taking core samples and caching them at various points for a future mission to come and pick up. So it's kind of writing the environment a little bit. So it's gone from pure read only to slightly read write. How much farther can you go on this? Okay, bunch of so examples. Is, so like, will execute be something like building there, building something <laughs> there. <laughs> exactly, so read write execute is the ultimate. And part of this might be that as well. So some of these might be going into execute. Uh, here's one, since I've been like playing with optics a lot now, uh, mirrors and lenses seem like a very good zero energy passive component to use in the environment. And this is an example. If you uh, drive through like parking lots, you'll often see mirrors of blind corners. So this one is at the exit of my apartment building. You can, this uh, mirror, 
you can see oncoming traffic. And when you come up from the underground parking lot, it's like a weaving tunnel. And there's like four mirrors that you see along the way. So this is uh, one good thought starting thing. And it might be good for exploring underground caverns with line of sight uh, constraints. Uh, passive is good if you're like, say on Europa and underground and you don't have solar and you can't afford to put nuclear on everything. So passive sensing capabilities are really good. You can build it up over multiple missions. So one rover mission can go leave a bunch of mirrors around and go away or die. Uh, next rover can come and use that infrastructure. Here's another example. If you go to tourist spots, you'll often see binoculars just sitting there, right? You can often put in a coin and um, use it for five minutes. So you can do this as almost a blockchain economy uh, type infrastructure. You have a bunch of little pieces in the environment and if uh, and maybe they've all been sent by the US, but then a Chinese rover goes up there or a Japanese rover goes up there and it wants to use the infrastructure and it pays in blockchain currency maybe. This one, um, it's actually coming up from my parking lot again. I found this really beautiful spider web. It's pretty complete and you can even see the spider in the center. Uh, this immediately caught my eye because we are building two spider bots in this group and spiders build webs. So why shouldn't our uh, robot sp uh, spider rovers build webs? And if you think about what a uh, spider's web is, it's a bunch of sensing cables where slight vibrations alert the spider at the center. Plus it also has some, uh, to Anuraj's point, it has a read write execute here because the some of the fibers are sticky and uh, prey insects can get trapped there. So it's uh, executing in a literal sense, it's killing the insects. So what does a spider web look like? What would it look like for um, the hexapods we are playing with to build a spider web, for example? Uh, this is, I think, the most uh, well-developed example that's already out there. Uh, I know many of the underwater oceanographic uh, research people using underwater drones they often use the strategy because underwater uh, radio frequencies don't work very well. I think you have to get up to periscope depth and you can use very long wavelength um, radio. Deep underground, you can't use anything there. Or deep underwater, you can't do uh, anything um, over more than like a few meters distance. So literally the only way to do like deep underwater sensing is you have like a sensor that's sitting there persistently, then a underwater rover visits it, comes within a few meters and does some kind of like either physical tethering or near field communications to grab the data and then move on. So um, uh, I think about 10, 15 years ago, when was this? God, so long ago, I interviewed at Embari. So this is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And this was the project I would have worked on if I'd ended up getting hired. It was literally, they have these torpedo shaped submersibles that go around uh, pulling data from like long-term persistent sensor networks in the ocean. So a lot of uh, such applications have come up and I've started putting some of these links in the Rome page I started for this. Breadcrumbs, uh, not literally, because if you remember in the fairy trail, the breadcrumbs actually get eaten and Hansel and Gretel can't actually find their way back. But bre breadcrumbs is a good strategy. Like there's robotics papers on this. Like how do you navigate by leaving little pebbles all around? might be an important way to navigate in underground caves or even you know, surface if there's no GPS or other aids, how do you use a bunch of things that you can drop around, right? Okay, this is actually some, a, a different project I'm doing, but it has some relevance here. So I'm trying to like build my own optical bench because I suddenly got interested. So I just bought a bunch of cheap lenses, mirrors and stuff and uh, started 3D printing the simplest possible design I could think of, which is, uh, basically the aluminum rail with these uh, lens um, carriages that can move back and forth. And this is by the way, what gave me the idea for the uh, variable structure rover design uh, I showed earlier. So it's gonna look like this. The uh, wheel and leg carriages are gonna be like these lens things. But after I started building this, it struck me that if I make these things so that they can stand alone and don't need to run on a rail, you can kind of make freestanding optical networks to do like, you know, uh, light path experiments. And then it struck me, why can't you have like a bunch of mirrors and lenses lying around and other optical uh, things and actually have a rover going around looking at them just as, you know, tourists go around looking through binoculars at tourist spots. So this is what I'm kind of getting at. 
So if I take all my optical components off my bench, um, this was what it looked like. So there's one concave mirror, three lenses. The one on the lower left is um, a diffraction grating and towards the top middle, you can see a uh, prism. So imagine you have a rover that has a bunch of little optical components that it can then sort of arrange all over the place to create some sort of uh, low effort, um, sort of long-term persistent roving infrastructure, right? And this is the kind of problem I'm made up to think about it. Suppose you have an underground system of caverns on like the moon or Mars, and you don't have like uh, radio connectivity, you don't get GPS, even if they put GPS type satellites in Mars orbit, maybe it's underground and you can't get to it. Um, all these devices have to be passive. So maybe one way you can do this strategy is you put mirrors in various parts of the cavern so that the rover doesn't actually have to go all over the place to monitor the status of the things it's doing. It can do a much shorter circuit and like from a distance, see what the mirror shows, right? Uh, I, I also showed a little bit of like, maybe you can build a, a new tunnel to get to an ice lake or something. So this is getting into what Anuraj was asking about, like maybe in a limited sense, you can do read, write, execute, like write the environment would be the equivalent of like, you know, putting mirrors that you can then erase or pick up, but then you can like actually seriously modify the environment as well. So the bigger philosophical question really is what is the extended phenotype of a rover? And um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this term, but it's a book by Richard Dawkins and he calls it his most important contribution to biology. His idea is that many species that like modify the environment you should really think of their phenotype as being not just their biological body, but everything they do to the environment. So for example, a bird's nest is part of its phenotype, not just it's like, you know, feathers and legs, but its nest is part of its phenotype expressed by its genes because it's not learned behavior, it's expressed by its genes. Uh, beaver dams, termite mountains, these are all examples of like extended phenotypes. So really we should start thinking of rovers in terms of what is the extended phenotype. I think this is my last slide, yeah. So I was trying to like start thinking of like a theoretical framework for this with a bunch of like different, you know, design spectrum. So the top one is what we've mainly been talking about. So the one extreme, we have the built environment, which is kind of what driverless cars live in, right? There's traffic regulations, roads are designed to standards. If you're driving a Tesla or something, it can sort of learn things like what traffic signals mean and uh, roads and lane changing. It's a very well-behaved environment. On the far right is a completely wild environment where big dangers can happen. You wander off the path a little bit and you fall down a chasm into an ice uh, lake or something, right? And in between, you can have like various degrees of writing of the environment, like transiently instrumented, which is like, you know, leave mirrors around, but pick them up later. Persistently instrumented. Maybe you like install a big telescope and just leave it there permanently for future rovers. Uh, caching is a kind of writing. So permanent instruments all over the place, plus like you're taking core samples and leaving them. That's, uh, you're getting closer and closer to the built environment. And at some point you're no longer roving on an unexplored frontier, you're building a city for rovers to live in, right? So that's the spectrum. Uh, the second one is, I think the more rovers you have in a field, the less wild it gets, because when you have multiple rovers, they can help each other and it's getting more civilized. So that's another aspect. Um, I'm thinking of this idea of like, uh, this is, I'm getting into like French theory, I guess, but uh, Deleuze and Guattari have this concept of rhizomatic knowledge, which is like knowledge whose uh, structure looks like a ginger root and arborescent uh, knowledge, which is kind of like a tree structure, right? So what do I mean by this? So tree structured knowledge would be, you have a top level mission, you fill out the, like, you know, looking for water on Mars would be an arborescent mission. It's a top level goal. There's like layers of like detail you go into and you explore Mars with the intent of figuring out whether there's water there. Whereas something like, you know, just generally explore what are the interesting rocks there? What is the geology? It's forming a non-hierarchical knowledge structure. That's what I think of as rhizomatic. Uh, and the last one is um, striated versus smooth. And the best example of this is the uh, movie Die Hard where Bruce Willis is constantly crawling through ducts and uh, going down elevator shafts. That's called a smooth structure. So this is again, Deleuze and Guattari. And striated means you use the things in the way they were intended to. So you go through roads or you go in the elevator instead of like up the elevator shaft. 
And the interesting thing about the smooth versus created is it tells you that the idea of roving is not so much about whether you're in a wilderness or natural environment versus civilized, but how you use your environment. So you can have the idea of like an urban rover where it does not obey traffic rules, it doesn't go on roads, but instead it climbs on sidewalks, it busts through walls or crawls through ducts. So then it would be a rover that does basically smooth ops. It makes its own roads, like you know, special forces in the military. But as traded ops is, there are roads and you use them. So th this is kind of my hot starter slide. And that's all I had, and it's just under an hour. So I guess we have time for discussions. So what are thoughts on read write rovers? Fabian, do you want to share what we discussed uh, yesterday? Uh, yeah, indeed, it's uh, really related to what we were talking yesterday with uh, Eric and Mayer. Uh, um, let me try to gather my thoughts. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we were kind of exploring the, the idea of uh, how, how can a rover extend its body or its mind in the environment, so a bit like the spider with the spider web. Um, and yeah, what, what what could it do? What would it be like for a rover? So I think you explored a lot of those topics uh, today. Uh, one thing we talked about was uh, yeah, creating tracks, creating a kind of road network, uh, um, which is interesting also because it relates to uh, what you can see in ants uh, leaving uh, pheromone tracks um, and. Uh, it's been done already to some extent, like uh, I thought which, plant, which mass rover did it, but uh, it was leaving tracks behind itself. And it was even used, in fact, for self-localization to improve the visual geometry. So it, it was not used to improve the mobility, but still it was used to some extent uh, for some real function. Um, yeah, so I think all those concepts are quite interesting. Uh, yeah. Mayor, anything you wanted to? No, I, I, I think I just would like to point out that uh, Venkatesh, you were talking about Mars, but you were focusing on uh, the caves and on the dust. But Mars is covered with pebbles. So when you talk about Hansel and Gretel leaving little stones behind, they can just move the stones around to make roads, but not in the sense of roads which are paved, but just road trails you know, like animal trails. This is where we went. And I guess one of the questions we were asking, it falls on, on the spectrum you gave. Um, you know, a rover goes places. Now, is a rover going only places where it's never been before? Or does a rover, let's say, map out an area so it builds, you, you supply depots or whatever it does in, in one area, and then it goes to a new area? Um, and the other thing, we were also looking at, at spiders, and we found a philosophical argument that somebody had in, in a scientific paper. Uh, is the web part of the cognition of the spider? Or is it just, um, I don't know, a tool, a sensor network, or, or whatever, which, you know, we didn't come to any uh, good conclusion, but the conclusion that I got to is that I definitely need to have a, a part of my garden, or now I realize I can just take one of the rooms in the house, pour Lego on the floor, pretend the Lego is Mars uh, uh, rocks, and then have my rover rearrange them as it goes along. And you know, when there's a dust storm, it can use uh, tactile uh, sensing to know where it's supposed to go. But uh, in any case, I want to tell you, we, we in independently came to the thing, we didn't call it read write rovers, but yeah, rovers probably interact with the environment. I, I want to comment on the example you gave now uh, from Dawkins' book. All of those examples appear to be uh, local. I didn't read the book. I'm just wondering if he has any examples for elephants. Okay, elephants are the great uh, rovers of the 
you know, natural world. They go from place to place. They know where the water is. Um, they know where food is. They remember it for 50 years. I, I wonder if elephants also have an extended uh, phenotype of some kind. Hmm. I know elephants make elephant graveyards, but that's kind of like more um, social psychology ritual thing. I don't recall reading about them, like, you know, leaving marks in the environment or things like that. Well, the example that, that I, I found was um, hunting animals, like uh, moles that build living tunnels and hunting tunnels, and shrews that build uh, pathways in the garden in the grasslands that they run around and check to see if any bugs came in. So it's like a spider web, except they're not touching it. Yeah. And your example of, of sensor networks is also an example of some sort of extension of the rover. And I would assume that when the rover moves to a new location, it takes the sensors with it. So sets them out and then after a while it collects them and and moves somewhere else yep or okay. if there's a collaborative system of rovers it might leave it for the next rover and like go somewhere else like you know there's interesting possibilities here but th then it's not part of the rover's extended phenotype then it's it is if you think of the system of rovers of the organism so then it, like, you know, ant trails, one ant rail lays down a pheromone trail, but other ants use it, right? But at the ant hill level, they're part of the same super organism. So let's say it depends on how aligned the individual units are. So this is concept that uh, Eric uh, told us about. Uh, Fabian, is it uh, stigma train? Stigma G. Yeah, Stigma. Uh, which basically means indirect communication, possibly through the environment. So uh, the classic example is ants. They either leave pheromones for other ants, or when you have a group of ants trying to move a piece of, I don't know, a grasshopper from one place to the other, they, the forces that they apply on the grasshopper cause uh, coordination. So that's like another type of extended uh, phenotype or, you know, interaction uh, with the world. That reminds me of like um, gypsies and homeless people. They often have like systems of signs that they leave around the urban environments. Like, you know, if uh, somebody who's like generous and gives food lives in a house, they might put a mark on that house that this house is a good person, something like that. So uh, I see the signs around sometimes. I don't know how to read them, but apparently there's like a whole code for that stuff. You can kind of like uh, see a very simple example of this with uh, rover applications. You can imagine a bunch of rovers doing rowing and a very basic thing they have to do is warn each other of danger, right? So each might carry a supply of danger flags, like red flags, and just plant it if it comes across like a dangerous thing. So very basic, uh, I guess that's not really as much stigmergy because it's not that indirect. It's fairly direct, except it's like distributed in time. You leave a message behind for indeterminate people who might, or other rovers that might come there in the future. But it's definitely a read-write robotics. Yeah. Okay, so you, you could, you know, taking it to Mars, the rover can mark places where there might be a cliff ahead or dust collection or water or a good location for charging your solar panels. Yeah. And whenever humans explore in groups, they do this sort of thing all the time. Like mountain climbers, there's usually a lead climber who like mark out a route, put in all the, I don't know, the terms for that stuff with the nails and grappling things or whatever, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so mapping is basically a reading activity, right? So the rovers are mapping something. So like there could be some shared infrastructure where uh, whatever the rovers have uh, explored, uh, it's uploaded somewhere. Yeah, and 
in the process of marking the territory to reflect the map, you're doing some writing as well. So signposting of any sort is uh, the dual action of mapping. Yeah, I think related to what Anuraj asked was like, does the environment have to be the physical environment or can it be the cloud? But if you have if a it's shared... in the cloud, I would call it read only because if you're not modifying the actual environment you're roving in, then you're reading. You're just storing it, you know, in your own disk space or something. What if it's not your own disk space and you're sharing it with other? I mean, it's a communication mechanism that doesn't exist within the rover. But it's still. Uh, I guess we're making a distinction between the rover system and the environment it is actually roving. So. To me, read write rover X, uh, I'm using the term to refer to, are you modifying the exp uh, environment in the process of exploring it? The and physical the extreme, environment. Yeah. And the extreme case of that is just civilizing it and turning it into a built environment, which is much safer and completely known. It is an ethical issue. Yeah. So that's why there's this level of, of minimum. But obviously, if you're going to walk somewhere, you're already causing damage where you're walking. So it makes sense that any markers you leave where you're walking are okay. So if you have a track that you created, you can mark, you know, five yards to the left is a source of water. That, that seems, you know, a reasonable uh, kind of trade-off. And also, I think the fact that in um, many outer space environments, especially, there is likely to be no life changes the equation. Like Mars, we talk about terraforming Mars. And here on Earth, we are very careful about even slightest disruptions to existing ecosystems. But on Mars, we literally can talk about terraforming because it's becoming, I think, fairly clear that there's no life on Mars. Like maybe there's still a 0.0001% chance there's like, you know, microbial life. But as far as I'm concerned, it's close enough to zero that I'd be happy if Mars were terraformed, honestly. I'm not against Mars terraforming. I'm, I'm holding back. I believe this more, a <laughs> bigger percentage. All right. Any other uh, thoughts on discussion topic? I have a question on how well a wheeled rover can uh, can write. In other words, do you have to have like a little bulldozer that you can move things around? Yeah, I guess you you would need some sort of actuation because uh, just wheels are not enough to do much at all. So mm -hmm. I was imagining some sort of like you know forklift type thing or like just even a drill or a bulldozer is another actuator you can use. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of, of nature's murder and can it use two of its wheels to drive and two of its wheels to act as like mini shovels? Yeah, I mean, you, you can jury rig something fairly simple in the design I have. You could like add a little, uh, like, you know, the old fashioned uh, steam locomotives in the US, they had the cow catchers, you guys remember? It's this big front thing. Right. That's effectively a bulldozer type attachment to a wheeled vehicle. And you could do something to any wheel design, I think. But from my limited experiment so far, I think you do need a little bit modification. And if you just try to push things around with wheels, <laughs> rovers will get damaged and it's not a very powerful actuator. So you need a little bit more to at least have passive pushing, which is on my list of uh, to do things. I, I was actually thinking, uh, I wanted to do something like a forklift. So that way you can move things around. And if you have like tiny little pallets that can be lifted, you can very generically move things around. So I was actually going to try and do a forklift as my first actuator because you need almost no actuation for that. I have a suggestion in that direction. Uh, one of the things that we talk about is making components that can be shared between the different uh, members. So when we talk about uh, REPS um, software protocol, it makes sense everybody's using some sort of Linux, we can share that. I'm wondering if it's possible to define a hardware component 
which is modular in the sense that it's easy to attach it to, an exist, to a wide range of existing rovers and attaches both mechanically and electrically and, I don't know, computationally or data control. So, yeah. so yeah. when you talk about you want to develop a forklift, I'm asking, can you develop a forklift that I could uh, attach it onto my spider and um, you know, and each one could attach it onto their design because it uses some basic assumptions like size and uh, offset and type of mechanical connection that's allowed. I think that would be easier to do with uh, payload hardware components rather than mobility hardware components or like um, things like a bulldozer. Like, you know, if you have a camera uh, gimbal system and everybody has a flat top payload deck, that's a fairly extensible platform. So we can all agree that our payload deck is going to be at least three inches by four inches and have like holes spaced so many inches apart or centimeters apart. And then we define um, fixtures like camera gimbal mounts or like ultrasonic sensors that all can fit on the same deck. But when you're talking about, say, something like a bulldozer attachment or a forklift attachment, I think you would need significant modification in each case. Like you can do a little bit of generalization. If you have a platform like the variable structure thing I showed, then you can do a lot of generalization, but then everybody has to use the kind of like tubing to construct a chassis. But if you have like a much more varied set of chassis, yeah, you'd always have to do some customization, I think. All of our designs have a metal uh, framework or housing. For example, nobody here made a soft robot or an inflatable uh, robot. So maybe that's enough. Could be, especially if you actually have, a, like for example, a ma magnetic attachment system. So asking everybody to attach a little magnet at the underside of their uh, rover is probably fairly minimal. And then you can pick up almost anything with it with a light attachment. So yeah, we should uh, definitely, uh, this is one of the reasons I wanna like try and build a range of mechanical um, configurations. So we have like a good representative set of like, what's the available space for generalization. But in general, I think the uh, construction mechanism of using the uh, aluminum cross-section tubing as a main structural member and then little uh, 3D printed parts for interconnect uh, joint type things, that's extremely flexible because it gives people a very big design vocabulary to work with. Uh, aluminum tubing is available everywhere in the world in various sizes. So if you can come up with an interesting system that just uses aluminum tubes of some sort and little plastic things that slide on the aluminum tubes, I think that will give you a very rich design space. So that's kind of why I thought we should try working with that space. And, and this kind of connects to uh, Rhett, you were talking about this kind of like modular design language earlier. Yeah. I think, yeah. Aluminum. I'm going to dig into that even yeah. more uh, during my session. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I definitely think you know, we should explore this and maybe come up jointly with like a simple design generator set that we can then make public for other people to you know download and print and build. All right, any more thoughts? Hour and 15 minutes. Right, I think we can call it done. And uh, next week it's you, uh, right, I guess. So uh, yep. yeah, you have a preview blurb or something? Uh, yeah, it's just gonna be a kind of a follow-up to the stuff I was experimenting with last time. And now I've got kind of a full build based on those, those elements. That's kind of a, a whole new rover. We'll see how far it gets by next week, but that's the idea.